In August 2017, it's the 50th anniversary of the Marine Broadcasting Offences Act. Way back in the 1990s, we spoke to a man involved with Offshore One, the tender taking supplies and crew to and from Radio Caroline. You're tuned to Radio Caroline on 199, your all-day music station. This is Simon D. talking to you on behalf of all of us on Radio Caroline, here four and a half miles away from Felix, though. Now, what can I tell you about uh, the station? Well, our technical equipment, I suppose. Firstly, the transmitters are made by Continental Electronics in the States and are 10 kilowatts each, two of them, costing about 50,000 pounds each. And they will shortly be looped together, I expect, to give us a stronger signal when all the... In this 30th year of pirate radio on the high seas, it's time to welcome to the studios George Gray from Brighton Sea, who was involved in those early days with Radio Caroline. Well, welcome, George. Who did you work for back in 1964 when Radio Caroline first came on the scene? I worked for James and Stones. I was the assistant manager, and uh, I was put in charge of all repairs and... Uh, mostly all the unusual jobs. The uh, manager, uh, John Kellett, he uh, came to me one day and he said, uh, we've been approached about uh, servicing a pirate radio ship which is coming off uh, Frinton somewhere about three or four miles outside. He said it should be coming in within the next few, two or three days. So, um, on the Sunday, I said to my brother, I said, get your launch out, let's go and see if she's arrived. Well, she had arrived, she dropped anchor somewhere off the uh, printing. And uh, we didn't go aboard because we weren't allowed to. But on uh, Monday, I told the government that she was out there, and we um, borrowed a fishing smack, and they took us out, and we had a look at her. We still didn't go aboard. And then, um, if you had books, okay. So we said, well, now we've got to purchase some large anchors and chain and cable and shackles and all the stuff and lay moorings for it. Well, we went over to a, a disused airfield at Earl's Cone. There was hundreds of anchors, all sizes that were there. And we bought these anchors, two of them, they were a ton and a half each, and big chain and uh, cables. And at the time, we'd got to get them out there, you see, so we'd got an old concrete barge, which was a dumb lighter, which had been used on the Thames during the war for holding water, fresh water. And we, we'd got an old railway engine, the old steam grab type, and we, we'd bolted that down on this lighter for our own use for dredging out the docks. So uh, we piled all this chain and anchor onto this concrete barge and got a sand barge to tow us out there. And I got steam up and was laying these anchors and they were going down with quite a rush and all of a sudden one of these snagged the bollard on this concrete barge and that and being with the crane on that end that really tipped it up we thought well we're going there but luckily we got enough steam to raise the anchor again and just release the chain. So uh, that was the start of it. So then after that uh, we were asked to Vetla supply with all the food and oil and water and everything was required. Also to organise to take the personnel out and uh, all their equipment. We used to go out perhaps once, sometimes twice a week. But uh, I had the job of organising all this, so I used to send a list ashore of what they required and I thought, well, I don't see any fun of running around all over the town myself, so I've got to 
a grocer up the road, um, old Edgar Hayes it was, and I said, look, I've got this problem, Edgar. So I said, do it with me, he said. So he used to go to the iron mangers and the fish mangers and everybody else, and we'd have all this stuff ready for me. And just below his shop was the custom house, because everything had to go through customs, because he was outside the three mile limit, you see. And uh, the customs officer at the time was Alec Graham. But uh, he was a good chap, he, he looked after us well, and he didn't let us put a foot wrong. And uh, so, uh, but before that stuff went out, he had to inspect it. So we had to just bring it down from, Edgar brought it down to the customs house, they looked, checked it over, and, and off it went. And when we come back from the ship, he had to come aboard, or one of his men come aboard and inspect the spot we were bringing off. So uh, that was all right. Well, while the weather was fine, we used a big fishing smack. But then it started to get a bit rough, and we had to take crews out and we wanted something a bit better. So we uh, went to um, Francis and Gilders. They were barge people up at Row Edge. And we, we hired some barges from them. So they we told them when we wanted one and they'd have one ready for us. Well, sometimes they'd come down and or on the off chance say, right, we've got to get this stuff out there, you see. Well, we've more or less got a barge on, on call. But one time there's an emergency, we've got to get some stuff out there. And that uh, had been a bit rough. So had anything hadn't gone out for a day or two. And we got no couldn't get anything at all anywhere. But we'd got the a barge on the slip, uh, sorry the Beverly Brook or the Wall Brook, and uh, a chap by the name of Red Scott was a skipper, and he had a mate, and that was uh, John Jeffries. And uh, so I said, look, I'm stuck. Can you come around and get somebody? He said, well, look, you're launching me this afternoon on the tide, he said. We'll go out. So it was just right, we launched her, and off he went and done the job for us. But um, when she first come in, all the high tensile cables were, were bare, you see, you know, there's no guards or nothing around them. So we had the job of putting guards around these things. Now, we got a crew together, there was Joe Scott, who was the plater foreman, and uh, uh, Bill Farewell, I think it was, one of the platers, Eddie Jacob, a couple more. We went out and had a look, and they measured everything up, got the stuff ready, and we took them out. Well, they had to wait till after 11 o'clock at night before they could work. Why was that? Because uh, the power was shut off then. I, I believe they only worked till 8 11, uh, broadcasting at the start. And uh, so uh, they got the stuff all ready, and, and they took them out there. Of course, during the day they slept or played cards or something like that, and uh, I mean, they get paid all the way through, <laughs> right through the night as well. They had about a week in that, and they got done well over that. But, uh, so they worked after 11 o'clock to get this job done. But um, the only people I can remember uh, that I met, well, I met them all, but uh, the only one I knew a little later on was Simon Doom. Can't remember any of the other names. That's going back a bit now. And uh, Mr. Mr. Gilman was the man in charge who we uh, had to deal with. But uh, that was quite an experience, quite exciting, really. And then you see, as things went on, it got a bit difficult. The post office was kicking up a fuss, and uh, in the end, we we. I, we must have given it up. I don't know what happened, but uh, we finished with it. And I believe that somebody supplied them from Mersey, but that wasn't for long. Then they had to be supplied from Holland. But uh, that was uh, the last we saw of her. But uh, one point was that when we were out there measuring up, uh, I said to Joe the four, would you like uh, a record play for you, so Joe said, yes, so, uh, what it was now, uh, blade races, something like that. So off we go, and go on ashore, put the radio one on the on the vessel and on the barge, and um, said that uh, 
they got this request from Mr. Scott, played a form with James and Jones. We're very sorry they hadn't got this disc. Um, would he like this one? And they, that was uh, Boy by Lolly, part sung by Millie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lovely. D just on the, the size of the boat, how big was the Mi Amigo? Was it a very large vessel? Did it have accommodation for many yeah. people? Yeah, sir. She had accommodation for the many. It was eight there and there was quite a few. But uh, she can't remember now how big she was, but uh, she was fair, a fair size. What was she used for before the days of pirate radio, do you think? Well, I she imagined she was cargo. Because I think she came over from America or somewhere that way because when we brought, they brought some stuff ashore and they brought her like portfolio of charts there me and me go and we got on this canvas bag and uh, that was left behind when everything finished. So uh, I thought, well, I'll take care of that and I passed it on to um, uh, the chap who was in charge of uh, Caroline Caroline Club. Club yeah. yeah. I passed on to him. Not that it was much use, I suppose, but that was the chart that we used when she came over. George, what sort of things were sent out to the boat? What sort of food do they ask for? What sort of equipment was uh, taken? And the equipment went out was um, all their discs and uh, supplies, that sort of stuff, you know. Uh, uh, and engine parts and all, you know, all the stuff. They supplied all that sort of stuff. Um, and I, I believe the discs were changed every week. It was to come down in big containers and were taken out and the others were brought ashore. Uh, then they asked for fresh vegetables and the normal groceries, fish, and all that, every, everything that, you know, get ashore, but meat. And uh, then we added in liver, fill, and water. And uh, most everything that they needed. How was the water taken out? Was it in bowsers? Is, was it in... That, yeah. First of all, we went out with a with a small launch of ours, with, with, which was a water uh, launch, fresh water. But then uh, we got um, some big tanks on one of the barges. We made some big water tanks and had to get them cleared and checked with the, every time, make sure that was clean. And that's every time the water out there and they fill a similar way. George, you've climbed aboard then, the Mi Amigo. What did you see when you got aboard? Well. An old vessel, really. They they did clean her up a bit, but uh, uh, just more like a a cargo vessel. It looked as though it uh, had been built up on her to form the cabins on deck. They had quite a biggish lounge where they used to sit in the radio cabin. But uh, I only went aboard a couple of times. Was it rough when you used to go out there? I mean, during the winter time, it must be very rough. Most it? times it was rough and very difficult because. Uh, where you've got to get from one boat to the other, you've got to wait for the boat to come down so they were level. I know that one chap, one of the officials went out there and he took his uh, son, a chap in his twenties, and he never got on board quick enough and he had a nasty leg. Never broke it, but it certainly made a mess of his leg for a time. What about the transport time? How far was she out from Brightling Sea? How well, long did it take? She was about three and a half miles off uh, Printon, and I would say, what, three, I don't know, about six miles or so, perhaps a bit more off from Brighton, see, the way you went, had to go out. But uh, that was pretty rough sometimes, and as I say, sometimes we couldn't get out of town, we had to wait for the better weather. Of course, when the Dutch did it, they had a tug, their big stuff, so they were all right. So any stories of uh, customs and people checking passports? No, no. Uh, we never had the passport business. Um, I should imagine when the others come ashore, their passports were checked. But uh, we, we were all right. So when did you finish with the Mi Amigo? When did that all finish? It started in 1964, didn't it? It started in 1964. I would imagine 
Off the cuff, I would imagine about 18 months. 18 months of supplying radio caravans. Yeah, when somebody else supplied them. Where did the disc jockeys come from then? Did they motor down from London? Or? They come down from London, probably by train. Uh, occasionally, we pick some of them up and down to Bronzy, down to our yard first, into our stores. And then they went, um, customs come down, and they went off from Bronzy Hard in the launch to the to the barge, and then they used to take them out there. Anybody feeling seasick? <laughs> or were they land lovers? I, I, I was, yeah, some of them used to be, but I, mean, I was a very good sailor myself. It's all right when they think it's moving. But when it's lying alongside and rolling, oh dear no. How long did you used to spend out with the, the boat then, George, not transferring? A, not very long. <laughs> Soon oh. I got off the better. Oh. Oh. Just the return, you know, till they got the stuff off and we'd done what we wanted to do and come back. What did you use to bring off the boat? Was it old records and yeah, cassettes? Just, just some records and stuff and uh, stuff that wanted repairing. George, what about the authorities when you used to go out? Were they keen to keep an eye on things? Well, that was um, up to the customs. I say we had a very good relationship with the customs. We were square with them and they were square with us, so we had no bother. And I don't think ever anything did come ashore, which we shouldn't have done. But you had a pilot, did you? Yes. Um, I don't quite know why we had a pilot. But um, that was uh, Herbie Chamberlain was the pilot, but uh, I suppose that had to be official, but there you are, we were going outside the limit and coming back in. Although the barge skippers knew their job, I suppose we had to have a pilot to make things <laughs> above board. I mean, off Frinton and Walton, it's quite shallow, isn't it? How deep w w w was she standing in water? Was it many fathoms or, or, or not terribly deep at all? I can't remember how, how deep it was off there, but she she was lying she was lying clear of the sands in there in the in the in a channel, but uh, not in the navigable channel, not the main channel anyway. Of course, during your time with the Mi Amigo, other vessels appeared on the horizon, didn't they? Next oh, yes, door, Radio yeah. London. Radio London. Um, what was it? The Lassie Fair and Radio England, Britain Radio. Yeah, and Britain. Uh, 201. 201. Uh, I know we had some for one of them. Not that wasn't Caroline. That was another one. Caroline London, Radio Caroline England London. and Britain Radio. Radio England. I mean Caroline was 199, was I think? 199, Caroline. Indeed, right. But also of Walton, there's another tower, isn't there? There's a tower off Felixstone, there's a tower off That's Walton. Right. That's right. And at one time they were going to do a television service, I think, in the tower. Um, what was the name of the tower? One of the wartime towers from up. But I know, remember one time, they asked Mopris to go along front and front and uh, blow the hoops and turn the lights out to the, to the Caroline. And one of our mates came in the morning, he said he went to them, how was the cars there? Mm. Yeah. Days of pirate radio. Do you yeah. miss those days, George? Do you miss the days of the high seas? I do, really. I used to go on all that stuff we built at the yard. used to go on trials, all the trials. They were all right, but they got monotonous. George, when did you retire from the world of ships? I uh, can't remember the date, but it was six years last January when I retired. And I'd been there, uh, man and boy, apart from a couple of years I had in Nigeria for the company. I'd been there 51 years, and uh, after I'd retired, a fortnight after I retired, the yard finished. Mm. So yeah, I uh, had a good time. You had a good innings. Didn't good you? innings, and uh, one of the lads did make a make up a video tape of uh, various craft that I'd launched and uh, the final days, and uh, it's quite good. Okay. So we've got this a keepsake. Does it show any of the pirates? The pirate no, this is, these are later ones. These are later ones. These are later ones. Well, thank you very much for coming into the studio That's and right. telling us all about the days of Radio Caroline. Well, well, thank you, George. Pl uh, please, somebody <laughs> realise that Brighton Sea did do something towards it. Brighton Sea certainly did its <laughs> part for Radio Caroline and the pirate radio days.
Queen of Rock and Roll. 